All right, so if we are, we're trying to answer this, this is our overall reaction. Sorry, I forgot to hit share screen. Um, is we're trying to figure out the, how many moles of silver chloride can be produced from this situation. So we want to start by balancing it. And if we look at calcium and calcium, we're fine. If we look at chlorides, you've got two chlorides on the left, only one on the right. So we'll need to do two there. Um, and then if we look at, that means we have two silvers now. So we need a two there. And that takes care of the nitrates. So one, two, two, one for balancing. So if we're trying to, so now what we need to do is we need to figure out what runs out first and then how much product we can make. And there are two ways we can do this. If it's, if it's an excess reactant problem, if we want to find what runs out because we want to know how much reactant is going to be left over versus if we're trying to do a, answer a theoretical yield question, they kind of, they kind of lend themselves to two different ways of of thinking about limiting reactant. Um, if we're trying to do a theoretical yield question, the ideal way to do it is to say, okay, well, I have enough calcium to make this much product and I have enough silver nitrate to make this much product. Whichever number is lower is the right number. And the logic behind that is I have enough buns to make 75 hamburgers. I have enough patties to make 50 hamburgers. So how many hamburgers can I make? 50. Um, if it's an excess reactant question, we want it usually, we don't really care about the products. And then we would think about it in terms of saying, okay, I have this much and it's going to use up this much of my other reactant because we're going to have to use those numbers anyway. But the logic is the same. Find out what runs out first. So in this case, if we're trying to, to figure that out and we're already in moles. So that makes this one a really fast one to answer. If we say, okay, well, if I use up all of my calcium chloride, and every one mole of calcium chloride makes two moles of product of silver chloride. And we can get an answer there. On the flip side, we can look at, we can do the exact same thing with the silver nitrate and say, okay, I have enough silver nitrate to make this much silver chloride. So 4.10 moles AgNO3, and it's a one-to-one -one ratio, one mole AgNO3 it or sorry, two moles of AgNO3 can make two moles of silver chloride. So two over two cancels out, you're gonna get 4.10 moles AgCl. So what that's telling us is that if we use up all of our calcium chloride, we could make 4.88 moles, but if we use up all of our silver nitrate, we can only make 4.1 moles. So the lower number has to be the right theoretical yield. And that has to be what's running out first. And this is our limiting reactant because it's the one that can make less product, right? So think about hamburgers and buns. This is if we have enough patties to make 75 hamburgers, but only enough buns to make 50 hamburgers, we can only make 50 hamburgers. So this is our theoretical yield. And that tells us that silver nitrate is our limiting reactant. And this problem doesn't even explicitly say that you need to say what the limiting reactant is. 
but you do need to pick one of those two numbers from the right-hand side, right? They can't both be true. Your theoretical yield can't be 4.1 and at the same time 4.88. So you need to circle one of those as being the actual theoretical yield. Um, but it's that, that is the, the logic that we're looking for when it comes to these theoretical yield questions. That help clear it up a little or, or help you think about it differently? Yeah, that helped. Okay. And for what it's worth, I think even if you, it means you have to do an extra calculation on number nine, that's probably the easiest way of thinking of, of figuring out theoretical yield. Figure out how much product you could make with, with reactant one, figure out how much of the same product you could make with reactant two, whichever number is smaller is the right theoretical yield and came from the limiting reagent. Okay. Um, and as far as reaction type, I think we can, you guys are, or you folks are getting pretty good at, at recognizing these. This is, nothing's changing charge here. Start with two aqueous solutions and you get a solid and another aqueous. Um, so this is a uh, precipitation reaction. Balance, balance the following reaction and write the reaction type, then determine the pressure of hydrogen that can be produced from 72 grams of platinum and excess H2O. So in number eight, I'm also telling you, you don't need to worry about limiting reactant. I'm going to tell you what's running out because really what I'm testing on this problem is, can you go from grams to moles? And then can you use ideal gas law to get to pressure or volume or something? And so let's we'll start by balancing it. We're going to need at least two uh, waters because we have two oxygens on our product side. And that means we're going to be making two hydrogen gas molecules. All right, so one, two, one, two, 72 grams going grams to moles. Go find platinum on the periodic table. It's right by gold. But 195.078 is the mass for platinum. So that'll give us a number. Of, or sorry, I typed that on 195, isn't it? Not 175. Yeah, 195. Um, so then we plug that in, get our answer. I'll give us moles of platinum. We get 0.369. We're keeping four sig figs, so 3690. And that's moles of platinum. So if we want to know how much hydrogen we can make as a pressure, we need to get to, before we can use PV equals NRT, we have to get to moles of hydrogen, right? So we're gonna do a stoichiometry step again. And again, the, the fact that this is an excess means we're not running out of it. So we can ignore water, just doesn't matter how much we have, we have enough. So 0 0.3690 moles PT and for every one mole PT, two moles of H2. <laughs> so 
So 0 0.738. All right, so th that is our theoretical yield in moles. But this problem is asking us to then plug it into the ideal gas law to find the theoretical yield in atmospheres, because that's something we can measure directly. We can't measure moles directly. And so that means we're going to be using ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. So N is the number we just calculated, is our theoretical yield of hydrogen. Volume and temperature were given. And then R is a constant. So when we plug all that in, we're just going to be solving for P. So pressure equal to moles, 0 0.738 times R, which is 0. Point, and again, I'll be, I'll try and keep uh, good habits here and actually write this all out. So let me give me some, some room. The temperature always stays as Kelvin. It always has to be in Kelvin. So if I don't give it to you in Kelvin, you have to put it in Kelvin. Okay. Um, and again, that's one of the reasons why it's helpful to write out the units on R, because it reminds you if you have any mismatches. So P equals 0 0.738 moles times R, which is 0 0.08206 liters ATM over moles times Kelvin. And our Kelvin number is 298. Oh, and actually we were supposed, to, that should be 7380 um, based on our sig pig. So I'm gonna throw that extra sig pig in there. Then all that is in 10 liters is our volume. So 10.00 liters. And when we plug all that in and get a number for it, I get, 1.805. And the only units that didn't cancel out are atmospheres. So it's an extra step at the end to go from your moles of theoretical yield into a pressure unit theoretical yield but it's just plugging it in and I have to give you enough information to do this, right? So you have to have a volume and a temperature. If you don't have a volume and a temperature or a pressure and a temperature or something, then you can't really solve, right? So um, basically what I'm testing you for on number eight is going to be, can you go from a gas unit of pressure or volume to moles. You either figure out moles as your limiting reactant or take your theoretical yield and turn it into moles. But either way, it's going to be that's that's really what I'm testing you here, testing you on here is can you use PV equals NRT to convert from moles or to moles? And so any questions on that one? Um, the only way that this could really be any trickier is if we made two gas products and I said, what's the total pressure? Because then that would be like the homework problem then where you need to find all of the moles of product, of gaseous products, and then plug that in for N. 
uh, plug the sum of those in for n, but the calculation doesn't change. You just would have to do an extra stoichiometry step. Probably won't do that, although I trying to remember, I don't remember how I set up the questions last uh, last year when I wrote most of these. Um, that would be unlike me, but occasionally I get a wild hair and decide to make a question just a little bit harder. Um, but that would be the way that it could be made harder is if there were two gas products and you would just have to add the moles together. All right, so any questions on this one? So hopefully. Is the reaction of gas evolution? Gas evolution would be one way to describe that. Um, metal redox would be another way to describe it because your platinum starts with a charge of zero and ends with a charge of plus four. Um, if you just left it as as redox, you wouldn't be wrong in this case because it, it kind of fits into a couple different categories for those more specific descriptors. Um, yeah, if you just wrote gas evolution or if you just wrote redox, those would both be full, full credit answers. Really, out of the redox reactions, the one that I'm most interested in you being able to recognize is a combustion reaction because those get treated kind of as their own separate category of reactions um, because they're so ubiquitous. They show up everywhere and have their own specific language a lot of times, even. So, being able to recognize a combustion reaction is the most important of the end of the redox reactions. Beyond that, as long as you know it's a redox reaction, that's the most important part. Are these the problems that'll be the ones we have like a week to solve or those are different? The ones that you have a week to solve, I think might already be available. I'm trying to remember. Um, they become available at 3.30. Okay, so just, no, so those ones are gonna be more like the homework problems. Um, there are multi-part, a little bit trickier, uh, maybe do some conversions along the way. These are the timed problems. And that's why I'm not having you do a ton of extra conversions for a lot of these. I'm going to okay. give you your your units in Kelvin and your volume in liters so that you don't need to mess around with that end of time situation. But the take home problems where you have a whole week, I probably am going to make you do those those conversions as well. Give us Give you a volume in gallons instead of liters or something like that. Um, but yeah, so, so these are the timed ones. There's 10 sections, which again, should means that you should plan on about six minutes per section, but some of them are gonna go fast. And you know that's what I was talking about with that. Make sure you get all of the easy points, all the quick points. Number four might even be the very first one you look at. I'm, if I was planning out my strategy for this test and I knew that I had a trouble finishing tests on time, um, I would probably start by looking at number one, read all of these questions, and then don't write anything down unless there's one you can do really, really solidly off the top of your head. Read them so your unconscious can start processing that a little bit, move on to the next one, and get your easy points for your sig figs, get your easy points for your counting protons, neutrons, and electrons. If you're good at nomenclature, get your nomenclature points. Um, with your open open note, should be able to get most of the points on number three too. All right, so and then start worrying about some of the the trickier ones, right? Um, and frankly, number seven is going to be one of the faster ones, right? You could probably answer number seven in thirty seconds if you were ready for it. If you knew it was coming, you could do number seven very quickly. Balance, theoretical yield, theoretical yield, circle the smaller one, done. Basically as fast as you can, can balance and punch numbers into your calculator. This one will take a little longer. Nine will take a little longer. 10 will take a little longer. The nomenclature will probably take a little longer because you guys haven't practiced it as much or recently. Um, but I would, I would try to have some idea going in what, it, what you were looking for when it came to that. Um, it's, it was only when I started teaching that I realized people didn't approach tests like that normally. Um, that's just sort of the unconscious way that I've always approached tests. I've always liked tests because it's an optimization problem. I just have to figure out how do I get the most points in the given amount of time. 
Um, and to me, that always made intuitive sense, but um, I've come to learn that not everybody feels that way about tests, so. <clears throat> All right, for this, for number 10, it's gonna be some form of word problem. I'm probably gonna throw in some weird prefixes and make you use prefixes to do some conversions, mega versus kilo, so remember how those work. Um, And then in this case, it's this is kind of a, a tricky question. If a car battery weighs 35 pounds, and then we have a, a number that says, okay, this is a combined unit. For every kilogram of battery, I can produce 126 kilojoules of energy. So remember, any combined unit is going to be a conversion, can be used as a conversion at least. Gasoline has a different conversion. For one kilogram of gasoline, we can make 46.6 megajoules. This is one of the problems with, with electric cars, at least until batteries get better, is you can produce almost a thousand times more energy per kilogram of fuel if you're using gasoline compared to lead acid batteries, which are car batteries. If a car battery weighs 35 pounds, how many grams of gasoline are needed to produce the same amount of energy? 35 pounds, that's not a conversion, right? That's a, just a, an amount. In most word problems that, that give you a bunch of conversions in the word problem, there's gonna be one number that's not a conversion. Usually that's gonna be where you wanna start. We have 35 pounds of battery. How do we get to grams of gasoline? All right, so we're starting with 35 pounds battery. If we have pounds of battery, we could get to kilograms. Probably have to look up a conversion, but that's that's doable. And if we're in kilograms of battery, we can get to energy, we can get to kilojoules. And we could stop there and hit enter and say, okay, a 35 pound battery gives off this much energy. And then we could take the next step and, and that would be to say, okay, how many grams of gasoline does it take to give me that same amount of energy? So the way that you could you would write this out is 35.0 pounds. Our conversion for pounds to kilograms is one pound is 0 0.453, uh, 4.53, Five, nine, I think. That's just taking the grams to pounds conversion and dividing by a thousand. Or you could go pounds to grams, grams to kilograms. Now we can use the conversion that's given. One kilogram of battery, 126 kilojoules of energy. Thirty-five times point four five three five nine times one twenty-six point five three five nine. Almost exactly two thousand. So. That's our number as far as how much energy one car battery can produce. 
if we want to take that and convert that into grams of gasoline, we're going to, we're going to have to use that gasoline energy density. So this is called an energy density. The amount of energy you get per pound or per kilogram of, um, of a substance is called the energy density, which kind of makes sense. It's how much energy you get per kilogram, right? Um, some things are more energy dense than others. So we want to take this number and get to grams of gasoline. So our roadmap might look something like kilojoules. And then our energy density for the gasoline is in megajoules. So we go kilojoules to megajoules to kilograms of gas. grams of gas. And in theory, this could all be done in one conversion if you wanted to. But it makes more sense logically to think about it. OK, I'm at first I'm going to figure out how much energy is in the battery, and then I'm going to figure out how much how many grams of gasoline um equi is equivalent to that much energy um but it could be done all at once if you were really good at, at longer conversions mathematically there's no problem with that Two point zero zero ten to the three kilojoules and based on our prefixes we can say well one kilojoule is 10 to the three joules and then 10 to the six joules is one megajoule Just based on those prefixes, you don't need a prefix to go directly from or a conversion to go directly from kilojoules to megajoules. But if you're good with scientific notation, you could do that. And really, that's the foolproof way of handling any any prefix conversions is instead of messing around with 10 to whatever powers canceling out on top and bottom, the way that's easiest to make sure that you never mess up with that is to take whatever prefix you have and convert it to the base unit, and then take the base unit and convert it to the new prefix that you want. Um, that will always work, and you can always use, and you can use the mod or the um, multipliers that are on the conversion sheet really easily that way you don't have to do any mental arithmetic um now we're in kilt we're in megajoules we want to convert megajoules into amount of gasoline so we can say 46.6 megajoules is one kilogram of gas and then we can say one kilogram is 10 to the three grams. So 2000 times 1000 divided by a million. Time, or divided by 46.6 times a thousand. And if you were paying attention to all of your 10 powers of 10, they're going to wind up canceling out. So your answer just winds up being 2000 divided by 46.6, which gives us 42.6. Grams gasoline.
all of a sudden that puts it into really obvious terms why why we can't just throw a bunch of uh, car batteries into a car and call it an electric vehicle and have it be able to go anywhere, right? That works for a golf cart where you want to go maybe a mile at best, but it takes 43 grams of gasoline to produce the, so, the same amount of energy as 35 pounds of car battery. Of course, that's getting better every day. We're not using lead acid batteries in, uh, in cars anymore, in Teslas. They're not running on those anymore or, or any hybrids. They're using other stuff, but um, it's why it's taken so long to switch over is because it turns out fossil fuels are really energy dense. All right, so again, this isn't one where on the fly under a time situation, you're probably doing number 10 last, you're already tired, running out of time. Um, I would not expect you to be able to perfectly get through these, this problem, the wildcard problem, and um, get the final answer under that situation. In fact, generally speaking, the wildcard problems on these tests, um, but they always have the lowest average of any one section of the test. And I usually only have a couple people out of a class of 30 that will get the right answer. Um, about half the class runs out of time or doesn't even try. They run out of time or motivation, um, one of the two, and just leave it blank. And the other half of the class gives it a try, but don't really know where to go with it. And so they get some points, but not very much. And that's fine. Um, but you're just really trying to, it's almost always going to be something you can solve with conversions, maybe a little bit of geometry. I did something like how many square meters um, or how many, you know, if you have a sphere that has this diameter, uh, what's the weight going to be? Kind of like that lead problem from way back in, in homework two or three. Right, stuff like that, where maybe there's a little bit of geometry, but it's mostly something you can solve with conversions. How are we feeling about this practice test now? Good. I just want to go over one more. Um the last one on the conversion sheet. I think on page five, I think I know how to do it. I just want to make sure. Yeah, this is that this is one of those where there's there's kind of two approaches and either approach will give you the right answer. You can either say, okay, if it's 343.2 meters per second, I'm going to take 343.2 meters and convert that to miles. And then I'm going to take one second and convert that to hours. So you can go just by breaking it up meters to miles. And then remember that it's if, if it's a fraction, that's always over one, right? Our fractional unit. So you can say one second and convert that to hours. And then at the end, once you have a number for miles and a number for hours, you just take miles and divide by the hours and you'll get your answer. Um, the other way that allows you to do it all in one conversion, which is a little bit more, a little bit cleaner and more, more elegant when it comes to showing your work is to, to treat it all as one conversion and just set it up as 343.2 meters over one second. We're going to convert, we're still going to convert meters to miles and we're still going to convert seconds to hours. We're just going to do it all as one fraction. So if we've got seconds on the bottom, and we want to cancel that out. We can put seconds on the top, say, okay, 60 seconds is one minute and it'll still cancel out just like any other conversion. And now we're in meters per minute. We wanted to go meters, we went one more step. We can then say 60 minutes is one hour. 
minutes cancels minutes. Now you're in meters per hour. Once we got the right unit on bottom, we can focus on converting the meters to miles on top. And you could go either direction. You go meters to centimeters, centimeters to inches, inches to feet, feet to um, feet to miles, or you could go meters to kilometers, kilometers to miles. But yeah, you just have to remember that that's a measured conversion. Then it's shorter, but might lose some. Um, we might lose some uh, sig figs if we're not careful. So to convert meters to miles, a thousand meters is one kilometer and 1.609 kilometers, one mile. Or like I said, go the other way, the long way and use only exact conversions. If you don't have that one memorized or you can't find it on the periodic table. And when we put all of this together, meters is going to cancel meters, kilometers is going to cancel kilometers. We're, the only units we're left with now are miles on top and hours on bottom. Right, so we still followed all our same rules for regular conversions. We just canceled out a unit that was on the bottom with a unit that was on the top for, for the first one part. And as far as an answer goes, we should get something roughly double that. 343.2 times 60 times 60 over a thousand over 1.609 767.9 miles per hour. And just for a reasonableness check, miles per hour is almost always is pretty close to double um, the speed in meters per second. If I got 766.8 miles per hour. Did, did you go the long way with the exact conversions? No. And that's where I'm just trying to think. I might, I might have just wrote a number down wrong, maybe. Uh, but I did. Or I did. So, so I also skipped and just did seconds to hours, also. But I don't know how that would change. So that could do it because you rounded in two places, right? Okay. I used, I used an inexact conversion, but I didn't round it until the very end. But you okay. rounded before you did your second division, right? Yeah, okay. for sure. So ideally, if you do, if you have something in the middle, um, the, the best practice in science is in the middle of your calculation, you save an extra sig fig or two okay. and just know that you're going to round it off at the end to avoid something like that. But again, we got really close to the same number, right? So it's still not that big a deal. Mm -hmm. And Katie, how'd that work for you? Um, it was helpful. Okay. That's pretty well. I wasn't going to do it that way. I was going to do it the longer way, but that's, yeah. And it's so with, within sig figs, we should get the same answer, maybe off by one decimal. Um, if you round in the middle, maybe off by, by one in the ones place, that's going to be 760 something at least. So um, when you plug in your numbers and go, go that way, you can always check it that way. All right, any others that you want to go over? We've been at it for almost three hours at this point, so I would understand if you needed to uh, take a break. I do have office hours tomorrow, and you can reach me via, via email if you have any more questions, or we can keep going if you guys are still getting something out of this. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Alan or David? Yeah, I think I think I'm okay too. Thank you very much for all the help. Where this is this is good to go over everything. Good, good. Glad to hear it.